It's March 4th, 2021. This is Rook. His music is gorgeous, evocative, and resonant. He's one of Iran's greatest contemporary composers, especially when it comes to film soundtracks. Christophe Rezaï can make you cry with just a few notes of some of his beautiful scores, and is the founder of the Noor Ensemble, fusing Eastern and Western traditions. But Christophe also has a surprising life story of a boy born in France to a French mom and an Iranian French dad who found his calling and inspiration living in Iran after dealing with tragedy and loss in his life. The great Christophe Rezaï joins me for a feature interview from Tehran, plus Chef Haas is here with the secrets of Sumac and Kion with It's All Persian to Us. I'm Gian Gomeshi. This is Rook. there welcome to episode number 90 of rook just 10 shows away from 100 welcome to those of you listening around the world in toronto in toulouse in tehran in turin and tokyo i'm running out tokyo <laughs> hope you're all doing okay hope you are mizun and you are ready for another edition of rook today in just a little bit i'll be joined by a man who um makes absolutely beautiful, cinematic, emotive music. The great composer Christophe Rezaï. I think many Iranians will have heard of him, but um, may not know his story. Actually, as I said in the intro, I grew up in France. Um, In fact, was in a whole other line of work. And it was going to Iran on a trip, uh, a visit in 1994 that created the conditions where he knew music was going to be his life and his career, and that he was going to do that in Iran. It's a great story, and I'm Uh, So looking forward to talking to him in a few minutes. He is in Tehran. Shaya, I know you know Christoph's beautiful work. Yes, and actually I wanted to say that he is one of my first role model to fuse Eastern and Western music, and I'm really excited. Yeah, he's he's not a particularly old guy. I mean, we shouldn't set him up as this uh, Mm. aged composer, but but what he has done, what he has created is this beautiful legacy in film soundtracks that I was actually surprised. I was asking around, and Iranians, many Iranians tend to know his name. We don't know a lot of people, I guess there's, Ennio Morricone or John Williams. There's not a lot of people who do film soundtracks that mm. everyone has heard of, yes. mm. but he's really made his mark in Iranian music. Um, we are on an ongoing mission to build a new audiovisual encyclopedia of Iranian diaspora identity. We're coming to you on SoundCloud, on Instagram, YouTube, Spotify, iTunes, that's Apple Podcasts, uh, CastBox, and uh, Telegram. And we want you to join our Rook community. If you like what we do on this show, check out our website, rookmedia.com. Become a patron. We we really depend on you guys. It can be any amount at all at rookmedia.com. A really big thanks to those of you who have become our patrons, even for $5 or $10 a month. We appreciate you. It makes a big difference to us, and we'll keep this, uh, this going, this exploration of the connective tissue of Iranian diaspora identity, and we'll do it with as few commercials and ads as possible. So rookmedia.com. By the way, everything that you want about Rook, uh, if you want to check out old episodes or see who our guests have been or uh, see the hospitality videos or whatever, it's all there at rookmedia.com. Hello, the fabulous Keon. Hi, Jian. Hello, Captain Reza. Hello, sir. Captain Reza, you are dressed like you are uh, auditioning for a 1990s fitness ad <laughs> or, or rap video. I, I don't know. Uh, like Keon, did you get a, a look at this guy before? I haven't. Se- what's He's wearing oversized sweats. I love it. And uh, like, you know, like Crazy. all, but they're all the same <laughs> lo- the brand and they're, they're, actually they look brand new. Are you wearing new clothes? Like, no, every day, every day you come all. in, you're wearing new clothes. You are, you're <laughs> yeah. the only person I know during the pandemic 
who has constantly been buying himself new clothing. <laughs> I got nothing else to do. What am I going to do? I'm wearing this friggin' <laughs> Ramones t-shirt I've worn. I've had this I've for about 30 years. You had this for, no, honestly, what is the oldest article of clothing? I have had this Ramones. Actually, this this is, I think I got, this is about a, uh, a movie that came out. Mm. This is probably 18 years old, this wow. t-shirt. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Early 2000s. Fun fact about it's me. It's not, it's got little holes in it, really? but, I, but I like <laughs> it. Yeah, yeah. You see, a little fun fact about me. My um, and this was this was the, the the scenario up until before COVID, but now it's a little changed. But the quantity of my uh, clothes and like wardrobe uh-huh. had hadn't changed uh, for since I moved to Canada. Uh-huh. Only you you had the so same wardrobe for many no, years. No, no, I didn't have. Is there a faster <laughs> way to tell this story? <laughs> I'm getting I'm tired. I'm exhausted already. Pants. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. If I buy this a pair of pants. Fact. I'm either throwing away one or like. Do it like these little donation boxes that you. Throw. I see. You would so always maintain the same amount of clothes same in amount your of closet. Clothes. Same amount of clothes. So if I'm buying a pair, if I'm buying a suit, I'm giving away like the. Okay. One. okay. I don't, and has I that don't changed buy. now? No. Nah, yeah. Because of COVID. your girlfriend. Or a little bit that had some ah. do it. <laughs> Is there any other reason other than no, your girlfriend? He too. blames it on COVID. Yeah, he's <laughs> he's like, like, oh, COVID. What you know other what? changes have happened in your want, life? I don't want to hear that. Be like, what? Now I'm the reason. No, she wouldn't do that. But oh, no, but I'm, I'm, she should be proud. I mean, you're dressing like a right? putting like a normal. superstar. But yeah. I, I, it's every day. But then there's variations. Like sometimes it's like a a new shirt, and like he looks like he's going to a man. And then today it's this Snoop Dogg look from. Uh, <laughs> I, I you, you, you came out of the chronic video from the 1980s I think it but it's brand new, but it's all like brand name sweats you know I don't the, dress to impress <laughs> oh you <laughs> sure do it looks hey like. listen yesterday was a landmark day for Rook sure was we posted our first video of one of our interviews since we launched people have been saying uh uh, is it going to be a video? Uh, those, <laughs> those people are my cousin. Uh, uh, no, I mean people have been saying that. You know, like uh, what's happening? Are you? And you know, I love theater of the mind. I love radio. I love audio, and I'm committed to that. And this will always be an audio podcast as well. But we we've, we've been working on this. Okay, we're going to bring some cameras and we're going to start shooting. And you know, we can't really in the time of COVID bring people in the studio, but everybody's doing the Zoom thing, and so we've started to record our interviews on video and uh, and so we did uh, on Monday we had Armin Amiri in Los Angeles and we shot it and we put a clip of that up yesterday mm-hmm. it's very exciting for it us it is exciting it's a massive move is it massive? It's our, it's our first video. Is it's that our not? first video. It's massive. Yeah. Yeah. So it's relatively massive. Other than the uh, little <laughs> selfie videos that we've made of <laughs> yeah. Lubia Polo and things like that. <laughs> it is you see, it's a big step. I don't think they count. So, yeah. So, if you go to uh, Instagram or Telegram or our YouTube channel, we've now, or our website for that matter, rookmedia.com, we've put up a clip of this interview with Armin Amiri. We're still figuring out the angles and stuff and but uh yeah these are exciting days we've started our our video journey and um what we're going to do is put up clips of interviews as well as keeping the full length shows on uh, for those folks uh, our, the majority of our audience are folks on on SoundCloud and Spotify and iTunes who listen to this as a podcast but there are people who enjoy the visuals and want to see those things on YouTube and Instagram uh, Shia, you're, you've got a big smile on your face. <laughs> Actually, I wanted to say that I really love the uh, frame that I... I the studio. S- yeah, and mm. and you are so charismatic. Uh, oh, I've <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I wasn't charismatic before. Yeah. You told me I wasn't. Now I am. No, so you go, he said... It's the problem is you don't have any charisma. Yeah, yeah. On, <laughs> you said I'm charismatic, but not on video, which was like the most the horrible thing to hear. I felt for an bad insecure. about it. Five episodes. Yeah. Later. Oh, now so it's, it's been really charming. And oh, I, oh, thank you. Shia's really, really turned really charming. it around. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, anyway, so if you want to see the video, it's at uh, Instagram, Telegram, on YouTube, and we're going to put up more clips. Uh, and I know we've got some special guests coming up next week that I'm really ex- excited about that we'll be shooting, we'll be having on camera. So um, uh, you'll be seeing more of that if that's something that you like. If not, stick to the audio. Um, Chef Haas coming up, talking about sumac, somal, yes, right? Yeah. Somal. Last week, um, he did the thing on Barbaries. And I realized that Iranians don't know what Barbaries are because you have to say Zeresh. And yeah, then they go, oh, Zeresh. Reza you know? and Shia didn't know what it was. Yeah. So. 
Well, did, you did knew. You know? I, I actually did. Yeah, you know? my okay. mother has has uh, <laughs> taught me such things. <laughs> that's, that's the first for everything. Yeah, that's Keon one Farsi no, word no. that I know. Keon knows <laughs> her <laughs> stuff. Come on. Uh, speaking of Keon knowing her stuff, it's all Persian to us. A new episode coming yeah. up in uh, right after Christoph. Uh, what? Any hints of what we're going to hear? Well, it's uh, something that's. Prevalent, prevalently used around the world right now. Prevalently. Prevalently. I don't think that's what you mean to say. It's, what is prevalent? It's, uh, it's, it's uh, prevalent around the Pre- world? Prevalently. Yeah. So, yeah. I don't A- know if prevalently I- is. I- yeah. <laughs> See, I, I, I always get confused because I went to a British private school for oh. the beginning part of my childhood. And then when I you switched. you were in Dubai? At, well, in Kuwait, Kuwait if you right. recall correctly. Like, like it's and a, then we moved to Canada and yeah. then it switched to wet, like Canadian American style English. So I was always confused. So. How do I, like vitamin, vitamin, right. jumper, sweater. I grew up in England. I understand the vitamin thing, but okay. I'm not sure prevalently. Prevalently. I'm not sure well, that you, you can blame that on uh, the Kuwaiti school. <laughs> <laughs> diaspora, diaspora. <laughs> anyway, yes. Yeah, so it's, it's a good one. Uh, let's look that up (laughs) i'm not even sure what you're saying anymore but it sounds like an exciting episode of it's all version to us (laughs) that is (laughs) <laughs> oh, We've lost just, the audience yeah, before. Christoph is in Tehran, like <laughs> reconsidering whether he yeah. should stay on the line. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, the fabulous Keon, Captain Reza, in your sweats, your outfit, <laughs> <laughs> your costume, and uh, the groovy Shia. Thank you all. We'll talk to you all in just a little bit. Let's get to our feature guest. And my feature guest today is a prolific Iranian-French musician and composer who can really make you feel with his pieces. He has explored various styles of music to great acclaim, including medieval, Baroque, classical, modern, pop, jazz, electronic, oftentimes fusing Iranian traditional sounds and Western music. But he is perhaps best known for his majestic movie soundtracks. Take a listen to this. film Canaan, or Can-On, as folks know it in Iran, the composition of our feature guest today, the great Christophe Rezaï. Christophe was born in Toulouse, France, to an Iranian father and a French mother. In 1966, he moved with his family to Iran, then back to France, then back to Iran, where he has been based since 1994, working in several musical fields. He has composed music for feature fiction films, documentaries, theater performances, TV commercials, audiobooks, and has been granted nine Best Movie Score prizes for his efforts. Christophe Rezaï is also the founder of the Nur Ensemble, The group's repertoire is a crossover between ancient medieval music from Europe and traditional or folkloric music from Iran. This ensemble has performed across Asia and Europe and has been broadcast across all kinds of media around the world. And the album An Homage to Tanavoli within which Christophe has a major contribution, has just been released by Gallery 10 in Iran. But right now, Christophe Rezaï joins me from Tehran today. Hello, sir. Hello, dear Jean. I'm very pleased to hear you. I'm so honored to get to talk to you. I really love what you do, and I thank you for taking the time to do this. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Really. Christophe, that piece, Mina, is so gorgeous. I, I, I adore it. Do you, do you like listening back to your own compositions? What is your relationship to a piece like that now? Uh, yes, some of them I like to listen to them and the filter of the time is for me a good filter to see what i've done before is still up to date good and um, yes this piece i like it very much mina from canon i like it very much and i'm trying to release again the cds and remastering and uh, remixing the strings and the piano because uh, this piece has been 
recorded uh, more than 10 years ago and well the sample that i had were not very very good so i want to try to make it better are you kind to yourself through what you call the filter of the time or do you hear the uh, do you hear the mistake i think of our, our dear friend uh, bob akamini who was here a few months back and and says he can't Absolutely. even least he, he won't listen to his first couple of albums because all he hears are things he would have done better uh, are, are you like that on some pieces, on some pieces, I'm uh, absolutely not kind. Uh, pieces composed for a special occasion, and now it's finished. I think the, the, this music has not uh, other echoes or message to give. Then I don't want to listen again to these pieces. But some of them, I like them very much, and I want to work again on those pieces. For example, uh, can on the film was released in 2004, I think, and, but the music only in 2008, four years after the, the, the movie. Why, why, why was that? Has, That's a strange business model to, yeah, um, <laughs> to release the music well, four well, years later. Uh, unfortunately, I, I'm not good at business and there's a lot of soundtrack that, that I, I haven't still released them. Uh -huh. uh, I hope to do it in the next few months um, Christoph, that's what you have a good agent for. So a famous guy like you doesn't have to worry about the business. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> because <laughs> the world of music has been so business now. Even in Iran, just 20 years ago, the, the rhythm of life here was very cool and I was very matched with them. And I'm still, I, I am. But now, during these really 10 years, a lot of people are doing a lot of good things here in Iran. And so the competition is uh, more than before. I'm going to get to your decision to move to Iran and, and live there. But just, just sticking with your music on a visceral level first. You know, I as I was preparing for this interview and immersing myself in the works of uh, Christophe Rezaï, um, your, your music is, is quite evocative it inspires emotion i mean maybe that's just a redundant thing to say to any musician but 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 i really feel that with your music is that what you want do you want to make people emotional yes 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 you know i'm really i'm trying to be honest with myself when i do something i remember this soundtrack of can on it was the second film that I was um, working with Mani Hariri. And uh, I remember the producer was uh, asking me for a soundtrack that can be like the track of Titanic. Uh, mm -hmm. It was very funny for me, not funny, but strange that uh, an Iranian producer asked me to do the same thing. But I had time. I had so many times, so much time. And I've tried to put my emotion. I, I was linked with the director money. With uh, I see a lot of time the film and this piece happened. Sorry, back to the emotion part, though. You, you you slipped something in there. Like you said, I want to make myself feel emotional. Is that part of it? When you yeah. write something, if it, bring, just, if it brings yeah, you to yeah. tears or it makes you sad or it makes uh, you uh, ebullient, you feel that will be the case with the audience as well? Uh, me, I, I am trying to be in the emotion that I want to give to the pictures of the movie. Writing a movie or writing book or painting uh, this um, sparkle of um, creation of uh, composition is very difficult to control it. You control it after, after that you have write this melody or find this uh, chord series or this harmony. Uh, after that, you work on it right. analytically. But on the process of creativity, on the the a special moment is impossible to to touch and to catch 
But you know, when you talk about the the process of creation, and I, I know that that's something that you do talk about because it was the name of your TEDx talk, in fact. This yes. notion that you have a director who says, uh, I want something that's like the theme of the Titanic. You know, that I mean, that's a very specific direction and it, it, it invites the question for me. Do you find it actually easier to make music for films in the sense that you are given parameters? You are composing for a specific focus as opposed to a completely open canvas, a completely open palette if you're writing for yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, not easier. It's completely different, completely different. Uh, it's not easier. Sometimes can be easier. Sometimes it can be uh, more difficult. But it's a very challenging things really uh, that you uh, put your uh, creativity for something that is not yours, and you have to try to be yourself, making something for someone else, composing music for for another subject than yours. Yes. Um, I was thinking in a way there is less, I mean, I know I've always felt less pressure if I'm writing something on demand. If somebody says, yeah. write, write a country western tune or write an editorial about this, it, it, it's I, I forgo my own self and my own needs. And my, in other words, if I'm writing a song, a Xi'an song, then there's a lot of pressure. Oh, everybody's going to judge this Xi'an song. But, but if I'm writing something because you told me to write it and, and in a certain style, I can sort of let go of that. Does that make sense to you? Well, you know, I think um, I'm not sure that it's uh, easier for me because uh, the thing that is very important for me is uh, that to try to be, to still be myself in the music that I'm writing for a, a uh -huh. special circumstance. Yes. I have to keep my own language. And, and this is very challenging for me. If someone can listen to Can On, then to uh, the What's the Time in Your World, then I don't know, another film, and can feel that, ah, this is Christopher, ah, this is Christopher, in different style, well, I'm very happy. But, but is that always I, true? Because, for example, you've done TV commercials. Surely, when somebody says, Christoph, we want you to do a TV commercial for a, a car, you know, uh, you don't have to, I mean, do you have to ensure that it's a, it's got the stamp of Christoph Rezaie no, no. Uh, arti no, artistry no, no. on it? Or, you know, no. No, no, for TV commercials, it's completely different. For movie, I think it's, it's important. When Now, when you listen to Ennio Morricone, he has uh, kept his own language. Yes. And, and that is the, the challenge of the uh, score music writing, I think. I, I love how much this means to you and 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 it should i mean you're one of the top you're the, the best in the craft in the world so why why shouldn't it mean a lot to you but you know you say in your tedx talk in tehran that you did in 2016 that that when you returned to iran from france this was in 1994 you realized that without working in music without being a musician you could not live I mean, this is quite an extraordinary thing to say. Tell me why and how you realized making music was so important to you that it was actually a matter of life and death. When I was in France, I have studied a lot of other things rather than music, but I was studying music uh, as an amateur. And uh, for me, it was obvious that I, I need music constantly or listening to or playing or not really writing. When I was in France, I was not composing. I was not thinking about um, working on music field even. But when I decided to come in Iran, one of my fear was that I knew that the music was not present like it's present in, in Europe or uh, other countries. Right. I think this is the, the, the magical part of Orient, uh, Persia, or Orient, the, the that sometimes some things happen that you cannot think about it just one minute before. You know, you have some event in your life, encounter in your life that I felt more when I came in Iran uh, rather than when I was in France. Huh. Well, I, I was in France from 12 years old until 27 years yes. old. So I, I have a kind of experience of life and, and meeting people. And But when I came in Iran, a lot of things happened from, to me that I was 
completely unexpected before <laughs> and it, it was so amazing for me. I felt that, well, it's good. The life is choosing for me what I have to do, so I like it. Um, on the contrary, once months or two months after I came here, I met a lot of friends, musicians that became my friends, and I started just two months after my arrival in Iran to uh, think very seriously uh, on working on music. And, and I, I had time to work on it. It's fascinating how um, interlinked your interest, your passion, uh, and, and now your career in music has been to where you are. Another way of saying what you're saying is, had you not gone to Iran in 1994, you may not have ended up with a career in music. Is that true? No. Yes, yes, absolutely. I was in France just uh, quitting a job, and before going to another job, I thought that it was the good time for me to come in Iran to spend five months or six months because, well, my father and my grandfather has done uh, several things here in Iran and we have a psychiatric hospital that my grandfather has founded. And after my father was the, the, the director of this hospital and, and this hospital now belongs to us, to my family, so I've decided just to spend five months or six months in Iran. Uh, it was after 15 or 17 years that I came back in Iran. My, my life has changed little by little. The destiny, the unexpected event just built my work and my career and my life. And, and I was very pleased. You know, you feel good here. Even if there was some a lot a lot of things in this country that I'm not accepting and uh, I'm not agree with the, this, but the rhythm and the path and the breath of these people and this country is fit to me to my conception of life and conception of rhythm of life. Cr Christoph, yeah. since you're talking about. Iran. Um, I'll come back to the music and in particular your your spectacular soundtrack work. But let me ask you more about your story and identity. You you were born in France. So to be clear, your mom is French, your dad is Iranian. Then you move to Iran when you're five years old with your family. You would move back yeah. to France, as you say, by your mid-teens in the late 70s. Uh, how did you self-identify as a kid? Was it confusing? You're this French kid in France. You're this Iranian kid in Iran. <laughs> you're both. You're neither. What was it like? How would you describe life as a kid in Iran in the 1970s for you? Well, in 1970, life in Iran was very easy, more easy than now. And, well, I was a kid. Everything was fine for me. We were living the, the place that I'm living now. Here, I'm just talking with you from my studio. It's the place where I was living before the revolution when I was a kid. Wow. We had a very good way of life before the revolution. Then we were obliged to quit Iran because of family problem. Not it was it was one years before the revolution, and um, in France, it, you know, I, really for me to be French and Iranian, it's, it's completely positive. I, I I felt good in France. I felt fine in Iran. I know that I have two places that I can go if I had a problem. Well, I remember that a lot of people asked me, How can you live like that? A foot here and a foot here yes. is not is it, isn't yes. it difficult for you to have two cultures. I think not. I think it's completely the, the contrary. We've it's, had people on the show, to be fair, like uh, Arvona Rizai, who's the uh, the tennis player uh, in France, yes. who and she, you know, she did talk about how uh, it, it was difficult for her growing up in France as an Iranian girl. She got made fun of. She got teased. She felt like she was different. Um, so yes. if you escape, but, but she was completely Iranian. No, she's completely Iranian. For me, it's easy, it's easy because my, my, my mother, she's French. Yes. My father was, uh, my father was half French, half Iranian. I think the, the, the one quarter uh, of Iranian blood that I have is very strong. <laughs> 
How did you feel about moving back to France in 1978 when you're 12, 13 years old after you've now settled and started to, uh, to really, you know, know your life as a, as a kid, as a preteen in Iran? How did you feel about having to move again? How do I feel? Well, in, in fact, I've lost my father in 1978 in a car accident. Oh. That's why we decided to move. Well, we did, my mother, I, I didn't decide. My, my mother decided to come back in France. It was oh. completely uh, a, a, a very good decision because she, she didn't have any other family attached here in Iran. Yes. I, I have a very, very, very positive um, souvenir from Iran before this accident. That piece of music, another selection from your soundtrack to the film Canaan, Can On. Um, Christoph John, what you've just talked about is a it's a lot for a 13 year old to deal with to lose your father, uh, to move to another country back to France. I mean, you, you would be forgiven if this would have completely derailed your life, maybe forever. You seem to have come out of it strong, but um, that's incredibly tough. Yes, I think it's yes, yes, that stuff. But when you are young and when you are 13 years old, you cannot feel really that well. I remember that it was very hard for me, but uh, young people, they can uh, not uh, forget it, but uh, they can uh, pass through this uh, and, and try to make their own life and to find another way to, I don't know, to yeah. perhaps the music. Is, I remember... Uh, here in in this in this home, we we used to listen to a lot of music. My father and my mother. My mother, she's still uh, uh, she's more than eighty years old, but she's still going to concert in in Toulouse in France ah. every week. I got this impression of you in in Iran in those years in the seventies as a kid, being mm -hmm. surrounded by music. I mean, partly because you've talked about it in in other interviews and 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 in some of your your reminiscence. Uh, but uh, in your TED talk, you talk about you mentioned being at yes. Rud Rudeki yes. Hall in Tehran at age nine to see Herbert von Karajan, the the principal conductor of the Berlin Philharmonic. So you were clearly exposed to classical music, and I'm assuming that's when your passion for music began. Yes, I think. So why, when you go back to France, why do you end up studying engineering and then you go into marketing? I mean, did you think music was not possible for you as a career? You know, uh, in a way, I'm a passive guy. I am i don't know how to make decisions for myself. Even I think my wife chose me, not me. <laughs> <laughs> she chose me. She asked me. Uh, and I said, Wes, yes, why not? Let, let's get married. I will be very happy. So, well, I was a quite a good student in the university in France. So um, I had the opportunity to go to, in, uh, to a, a school engineer in Toulouse, which was good. So I thought to myself, well, let's go to study uh, hydraulics and thermodynamics. It's <laughs> funny. I can't do that. Let's do that. Well. I, I don't want to to criticize her. I think my mother pushed us to do good study right. because when my father died, my mother was 40 years old and then she has been obliged to work again Yes, when we came back in France and to study again. So probably she had this, you know, this feeling of you have to be the best yes, and at yes. that time to be the best is to to be an engineer to be a doctor so i i, I think I, I was listening very passively to what my mother wants and i never really decided to do something 
one times I remember I've tried, well, after uh, I, I was playing piano, and then uh, when I was 18, I, I quit the piano. And then I, uh, I went, I started to sing, to sing in different choirs, and especially in Baroque choirs. It was a period where the Baroque music was experiencing a very new things on the way of interpretation. So I, I began to sing. I, I began to sing. I, I had a good voice, I think. No, you, have a, you have an amazing voice, not just you think. Um, let me ask you about this Baroque uh, and Renaissance music because it's a it's a bit of a puzzle to me. I mean, I'm uh, I, you know I'm a kid who grew up listening to David Bowie and then you know <laughs> I, I don't know rock bands and then Radiohead. You know, so so um, by the early 1990s. You're in France, you play the piano, you're singing in choirs, you decide to really focus on Baroque music. It's, it's curious to me. What was it about ancient Baroque music? I mean, why not be learning Jacques Brel or, I don't know, Lionel Richie yeah. or, or well, Bruce Springsteen? Brel, when I was in Iran. When I was in Iran, we, we were listening to Jacques Brel and Léo Ferré and Mouluchi <laughs> okay. with okay. my mother and my father, I think. But why Baroque music? Yeah, that's why I insist on the fact that I, I'm, I'm a passive but positive. I accept everything that I felt uh, I like it. For example, you say David Bowie. I remember when I was 15 years old, I have uh, I remember I have an, an English correspondent. So we have correspondence just to study English language. Uh -huh. okay? And I remember I spent uh, 15 days in, in the south of London in, in a place, uh, the name was Stock on Trent. Uh -huh, yeah. If you remember, it was the beginning of the punk movement uh -huh, at this yeah, time. It was yeah. in the beginning of the 80s with uh, Sid Vicious and Johnny Rotten. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the and Sex Pistols, yeah. At that time, yes, I was, this, I, we were, I was listening to The Clash, to Jam, well, Sid Vicious with the album of uh, uh, Nevermind the Bollocks yes, of uh, yeah. Johnny Rotten. Yeah. Yes. Now you're talking my language. How do we and go from that it. to Bar how do we go from that to Baroque? <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. I, uh, this is uh, I, I really as I am acting with my heart. Yeah. And uh, what I like without without background of uh, I don't know. Uh, By the way, the music that you make is so. Uh, interesting and diverse it actually totally makes sense to me that you are someone who one way or another has schooled himself in everything from the clash to baroque mm -hmm. music because we hear that in what you do so let's just pick up the story here because you're in france and you decide um you know engineering and then marketing being a corporate guy whatever this is not for you you, you want to take some time off and you decide to go to iran for a few months and of course in 1994 as the story goes you never leave leave um what what was what what you think will be a short visit turns into a, a lifelong uh return to iran and I, we've talked about this a little bit now but i just want to drill down on it one more time because i find it fascinating that in fact it was your return to iran that convinced you that music was going to be your career it's fascinating because from the outside uh, christoph that's that seems counterintuitive that you would choose iran due to opportunities in music we hear so many stories of talented Iranians post-revolution, of course, who have left Iran to pursue a creative career, many of the musicians. Uh, and then there's someone like, uh, you know, uh, dear uh, Reza Tajbakhsh, who I'm sure you know, who we had on the show last month. You know, he's, he's someone who's never left Iran. He just grew up there. He plays music and he's in Iran. But for someone who was already in the West, in France, and already half French, it's a very mm. curious choice to return to Iran for the sake of music, or at least to stay for the sake of music. Can you really explain what Iran offered musically that the West did not? When I came in Iran, I discovered that I have time. I had so many time to complete all the time that I, I can't have in France because uh. I was studying 
engineering and marketing so i didn't have so many time to work on music to spend you know to uh, rehearse the piano or to listen to music or to trying to study other things so here in iran in 1995 i had time and then after that one of the things that was very exciting and obvious for me is that well my culture my musical culture was more occidental and european yes okay yeah so when i came here i find that i i don't know iranian music iranian traditional music iranian folk music so it was for me another discovery uh, then i i felt that i have to do some things on this uh, with my uh, european culture musical european culture with uh, iranian music i i have to do something but i have to to find something on it i think all the the first compositional experience that i've done it was on this uh, crossover between east and west between occident and orient between iranian music and um european composition way of composing music yes well, i think this is the field that uh, push me to stay here and to believe that i can find uh, a known way of uh, making music have you had moments in the last 25 years where you think man you know if i was in Hollywood uh, right now or something I could be John Williams or Ennio Morricone you know and instead I'm I'm kind of out of the mainstream here in Iran does do you, do you, do you have those feelings No no absolutely not I I I was I I will be very pleased that if something happens like that if I can go to work in Hollywood why not I'm very very pleased I'm very excited and I'm very honored but no it's never no no I'm very happy here. You seem very passive. Did your wife choose you? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Even if I love her so much, but she chose me. She asked me. But you know, I'm passive because it's not. It's it's not passivity. It's contemplation. I, contemplation. I am. You know? I am. I'm. Shuhim kuna. I. I. Yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. No. But, but I'm passive. But yes, really, I'm passive. But I'm passive, not to not be active, but but to. contemplate to yes. see what will happen and it's i think it's very it's very uh, um important by the way one of the most interesting points that has come out in this interview that i find uh, it's got my mind uh energized is is what you said about iran offering you at least in the 1990s when you returned there the space and the pace of life for you to be able to evolve into the person you've evolved evolved into as a musician as a composer etc that is so interesting um in other words because we know what the the rat race pace of life is like in places like toronto or london or new york or i i guess paris uh paris is a little bit different uh, but but uh, um but that's just fascinating that is so interesting that what can be fostered from a different pace of life and a different set of priorities in in terms of the way one lives one life well now it it has changed so much because of the pressure financial pressure and even the financial pressure that modern life i think us in europe you cannot say well tomorrow i'm not going to work no in mm-hmm. even if you have a good life in toulouse in paris in toronto you cannot say that but here in iran in tehran you you could do that just 10 years ago now it's a little more difficult uh, it was different different for me France. You know, I have to ask you about the Noor ensemble because this is how some people will know you or know of you. You f- you founded yeah. the Noor ensemble in two, in the year 2000, which recreates a kind of musical dialogue between the east and west as you've been talking about inspired by both European uh, medieval music as well as traditional and and folk Persian music. Uh, let me play a little taste of the Noor ensemble for people. This is a piece that uh, I particularly like called Lullaby. Take a listen to this. Yeah. 
Little taste of the music from the Noor Ensemble and from the album Alba from 2005. Uh, this is Christophe Rezaï, an ensemble he has put together. You know, what I love about that, that piece is it seems to me, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but even in what we just heard there, it exemplifies everything that you are, that you've learned. In other words, I could hear the sounds of Baroque choir music there, but I can also hear Eastern Oriental sounds, as you called them. Um, just in that piece, tell me about putting this ensemble together and this, uh, the mission of this group. When I came here in Iran, I tried to uh, find musicians to make Baroque music and Renaissance music. And uh, very rapidly, I met some people just to, to have a, a, a vocal quartet with two women and two men. Uh, but after a couple of months, we had problems with women because, well, the parents didn't allow them to come to rehearse with young men. So uh, I've decided to make a, a quintet of only uh, men voices. And we started to rehearse for one year or two years, a repertoire from the Renaissance, European Renaissance music, like Monteverdi or Thomas Tallis, which was a, an English uh, composer. Our main uh, goal was to have pleasure together and to construct the sound of this ensemble. After two years, we decided to, to have a, to make a project that these five people, they go to sing in Armenian and Assyrian churches for the fourth or sixth century in Azerbaijan province. And we made a movie, a documentary of these four people going to different churches in Iran and singing first Baroque pieces of four or five voice to have a, a sort of crossover experience between music and architecture wow uh, spiritual music belonging to those places but those places i never heard that kind of music and the name of this um, documentary was noor voices and churches of the iranian azerbaijan hmm. and after that one night i began with my friends to sing one of these medieval pieces and Mustafa Mahmoudi is a Kurdish singer, he's Kurdish. Mustafa begins to uh, improvise on this. Ah. And I felt that there were so many uh, common things between those two music. Well, I think, I think if you didn't tell anybody... If you didn't tell them, if you didn't, get, if you gave somebody no background, even somebody with some musical knowledge, and you just play that that song lullaby from Noor Ensemble, they wouldn't be able to tell you where that's from because it's <laughs> it's very difficult to deconstruct because it does sound yes. both Western and Eastern yes, at the same time. Lullaby is a little different. Lullaby is a little different because the lullaby is, uh, in fact, is it's a, it's a Kurdish melody. Yes, but on this album, other pieces like the first Alleluia or the Conctissimus Concanentes or Miragres Fremosos, those are the mixing of two existing melodies. Uh, one, this is the folk melodies from the Kurdistan or Iran. And on the other side, this is the, the European part. To, I've used two sources, one or Gregorian chant. Mm. And the other is very interesting, is the, some manuscript from Spain called Cantigas de Santa Maria. That's why I speak a little Spanish. <laughs> yes, yes. Let me ask you this, um, Christoph. I'm, I'm, I'm curious because, yeah. in a way, what you're doing is so exciting. Even, even in your soundtrack work, sometimes you fuse these Eastern and Western styles. Um, but on the on the other hand, I know that there's purists out there. Does anyone ever take umbrage? Does anyone ever have a, a problem with you fusing these traditions? Are there Persian classical music purists who don't appreciate the mixing of styles? Mm, no, not really. No, no, no. Because you know, um, when I want to do that kind of mix, I 
work together with the musician. I ask to the musician to give me their music, to play how they have to play, to improvise how they have to improvise. Because as you know, well, the Persian music is much more improvised, but there is a a very specific type of improvisation and code that you have to put together. Uh, I was using (laughs) my Iranian musician friends as a a computer file, just, well, (laughs) you see the harmony is minor, minor, and have you got in your in your database a melody that can fit to this? <laughs> and most of all, it was oh, no, 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 oh this is, can be good. I was only a, a, a coordinator of all of this melody to give sense to show fighting between the words, fighting between the melodies. I was the organizer of those uh, melodies and those idea of confrontation between east and west, between. A different way of singing, playing, and... uh... How do you, at this stage now, choose what you're going to work on? Because it occurs to me that you've got, you know, I called you prolific in the introduction as this person who pumps out a lot of stuff. I mean, and I've mentioned that you've carved out this stellar career in various musical realms, and particularly as the composer of movie soundtracks, you've now worked with uh, Mer Jouy, and uh, you mentioned Mani Hakiki and Shahram Mukri, and uh, you're, you do a lot of that, and the list is composing music for more than 50 short and long movies for documentaries, theater performances, TV commercials, audiobooks, all of that is going to take away from exploring uh, Occidental and Oriental sounds put together. Um, How do you choose what, but I'm assuming the movie soundtracks help pay the bills too. So uh, there's a, there is a business element to that. How do you choose what you're going to do next? Well, uh, it's a great question. The the main things for me was the, the connection with the director, even if the film was not good. In, in my way, in my view. Uh, if I, I have a good connection with the director, if uh, it was enough for me to work for his movie, because uh, the more we know each other with the director, the more we can do very precise things. The, the experience of working a lot of movie with one director, is, I think it's very interesting because, uh, in fact, uh, making music for a director is a way of know, knowing each other. Me, when I talk with the director, which normally is very, you know, ego person, because to <laughs> right, be a director right. sure, of cinema yeah. is very hard yes. because you have to be a leader. You have to be uh, someone who can manage the shooting, the maquillage, the actors. So you need a strong ego and strong. So when you talk with those people, they never listen to you. They always listen to them. Right. So, me as a composer, I have to understand them, but with not a very equal language because they're talking about them. Well, it's good. I, I want to. But when we work together, we can have an unconscious relation. It's like for me, so for like an ensemble that I have, an, a musical ensemble that I've played for 10 years together on one year. Interesting. It happens sometimes that I cannot connect with the director, so I choose more the quality of the movie, the quality of the film. Christoph, it is such a, a great pleasure talking to you, learning about your process, hearing about your creativity, um, understanding your journey. I would be remiss before I let you go if I didn't ask you about this um, very quickly, about this new album, An Homage to Tanavoli, that has just been released in Iran, yeah. and you composed one of the three pieces on this album inspired by the Lions collection of Paravis Tanavoli. Of course, we had Paravis on the show not too long ago. We are fans of his. I'm assuming... You are a fan of his. Tell me about tell me about composing music based on an existing visual collection of sculptures or visual art. My piece on this project, uh, I'm very very honored to have done that, is most I think based on the personality of Parvizi Tanavoli as an artist. He's uh, strong and he's calm. And uh, I've tried in the first piece to talk about the, you know, the doubt that an artist can have 
when he is creating and how the how the creations can begin like a very little sparkle of an idea and then grow so it's explained by the orchestra and the second piece the second movement of my piece it's it's the lions it's a very brassy short movement very rhythmic very precise and it was great experience ah, i very much look forward to hearing this listen i want to go out on a song from your music for the last fiction this is an animated film from 2017 and this is a piece called Faronak. and the singer we hear on this is the the spectacular high voice of majid solari tell us about this piece in this movie there is three deaths the death of Faronak, the death of Tahmures, and the death of Ruzbe. And I've decided to use uh, vocals on, on them. For the death of Faronak, Faronak, she's the mother of, of Ereinun. And uh, uh, Zahok has the prediction that one of the young boy that is just born in, in, the, in the city uh, will kill him when we be young. And so he decided, Zahok decided and ordered to go in the city and to kill all the young uh, little boys that have born. And for me, this idea is a universal. You have it in the story of the Bible with, uh, I think, Herod, who has given the same order to kill all the people, all the, all the young guy. And Majid is singing uh, lullabies on this text, talking about killing of young people. In a way, the death of these young people is a sort of, you know, uh, sleeping, but uh, uh, eternal sleeping. Huh. That's, that's re- really interesting. I, I, I can't thank you enough. I have so much enjoyed talking to you. Ah, thank you. Thank you. Yes, surely. Merci. Khayesh mukana. Mochaker. Khodafes. Khodafes. Christophe Rezaï, an award winning Iranian French musician and composer, we reached Christophe in Tehran today. Majid has. Yes. I can't even believe he's got that voice. I mean, that's, that's remarkable stuff. A piece called Faronak. Uh, the fabulous Christophe Reza. Boy, did I enjoy talking to him. The microphones are back on for Captain Reza, Groovy Shia, the fabulous Keon. Um, well, I should go to you first, Shia, because uh, that was a, a most musical of interviews. Uh, yeah. How did you feel? I mean, I'm shocked. I am shocked. I, I know Christoph, but I didn't know about uh, his story and uh, you know his uh, b- background, family, and I'm really shocked. Uh, actually, I, I loved him before, but now I love him more. He is. It's hard not to love him. Yeah. Listening to him with that friendship. What 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 are you shocked about? What part of the story was is shocking to you? Uh, first of all, I didn't know that his father is also French Iranian. Yeah, he's <laughs> mostly French. Yeah, he's, he's a French a, composer. Yes, yeah, yeah. yes. And also, it's shocking for me that he came to Iran and he find out that oh, w- we need music. Yes, yeah. what the, that was the big takeaway for me. I, I could have, I actually wanted to talk about tell him a lot more about it, but I it. it 
the fact that he was saying, I was going to say he was implying, but he actually kind of explicitly said, Iran of the 1990s uh, created the space for him to be able to explore music in a way that he didn't feel like he could in the West. That's so interesting. Yes. We haven't heard of uh, very much about that kind of trajectory of, you know, of the creative inspiration based on the pace of life and then the related space that that would give him to, uh, uh, I don't know, less work opportunities or, or, or less of a rat race at that point, and when it, especially when it comes to the music industry and soundtracks and things like that. So he goes there and he goes, oh, I can really settle into a music career. Yeah. Can't live without this. This is what I'm going to do, and I'm going to stay in Iran, despite the fact that I'm a French citizen who could live in the West and you know create music anywhere. It's it's really really interesting, Captain Reza. This was my favorite interview of all time, hands down. Wow. wow. Yeah, really was. Truth be told, like I've and I've I, I've never said this, but because I've never had a favorite interview, <laughs> like I've had a lot of interviews that I like truly, but. This one was truly my like. I'm gonna, I'm gonna when we release it tonight. Like I'm gonna go back and listen to it again because I really, really enjoyed it. And he reminds me a lot of Shia, actually, his mm. personality, character, and even the French accent. And <laughs> yes, <laughs> especially specifically yeah. French accent. Him being like yeah. a quarter f- Iranian, the and accomplished and composer <laughs> of <laughs> film. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, the, you mean his gentle his demeanor, gentleness, yes. and and also when he was talking about him being passive. Uh, or taking yeah. life as it comes. Yeah, I he reminds me a lot of Shai because we be, Shai and I ha- have had this conversation many times. That is like, yeah, I have interest in film and this and that, and um, this is what I do now. But mm-hmm. who knows what's gonna happen in the future? And I love that, and I feel like that's uh, that that may have attributed to his success in in a lot of ways. Because if he wouldn't have, if he had this certain mindset of no, I'm gonna live in French. I'm mostly French than mm. Iranian. Mm-hmm. If I, I I gotta live in France, I gotta do this. I have this. Maybe he wouldn't have been the success that he is. Maybe he would have turned out differently. But the fact that he took life as, as you know what I want to do? I would take this conversation. Yeah, I'm gonna do it on Clubhouse. Oh, that's <laughs> a like good that? idea. Right? Actually, I we'll love talk that. about we'll talk about this. Maybe tomorrow night. Maybe Friday yeah. night. We'll we'll do we'll do a an, a, a rook after show. We'll talk about this oh, because this this idea of of um, uh, first there's two ideas there. One around um, taking life as it comes. Mm. Uh, mm. I mean, he's saying a, I'm a passive person, but another way of saying that might be that I'm open. I'm I open, open myself to, to what yeah. to the road uh, mm. showing itself to me rather than trying to be uh, the yeah. architect mm. of the road. Mm. But the second thing about going back to Iran and the pace of life and all of that really? that's um, that's something that we could have a. We could uh, continue. There, we'll invite some guests, and we'll. Uh, yeah. So maybe clubhouse tomorrow night, like Friday night. We'll That's see. It's a good idea. Okay. I love it. I love it. You have to be there then, Kia. I will be there. Right. You let me know when, and I'm there. Ka- uh, Captain Rizzo, will you be wearing your outfit? For <laughs> Please if we, do. If we go on to clubhouse. <laughs> Here's the thing. I know it's audio only, you but I want to make it. sure that you <laughs> yeah. want to wear that. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna wear my hip hop <laughs> outfit that you've got on today. <laughs> oh, the big chain. Kian John, do you want to say something about Christoph? I, I just, I, you know me, I, I adore classical music, not specifically Baroque, but he's actually opened my eyes to that style of music. I don't think I, I've known any Iranian um, movie composer specifically, so this was a first to me. Um, he's kind of like the Iranian uh, uh, Franz Zimmer, if you will. Is that Hans, the? Zimmer. Hans Zimmer, yes. <laughs> Franz, Franz Zimmer. being his brother. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yeah. yeah, but no, exactly what Reza <laughs> says. <laughs> <laughs> Stop making fun of me. <laughs> Stop calling me Franz. I am Hans. Yeah, you're my favorite yeah. person. You were thinking Hans and I'm France, just, and you put it together my words right for France. Today, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but no, exactly what Reza says. Like it's somehow the universe paved the way for him to. Like it was by accident, right? That he went back to Iran and somehow. No, no, no. He no, no, no. That but it wasn't, wasn't for music because he said I needed to take a break, and right. I thought by going to Iran I would become inspired, so I would take some time off. Right. But he hadn't planned to necessarily stay he had no plan exactly and then that was 26 years ago and the or universe just somehow built this and what does that tell you for him just let life stop happen. estressing about <laughs> where your path i need just to let take it, his advice yeah, yeah. and listen. you know whose advice you should take who's franz zimmer <laughs> <laughs> noted sibling of hans zimmer 
uh, uh, Franz Zimmer. He's <laughs> he's a he, you're he's supposed a to make fun of Reza. <laughs> what, what happened? <laughs> it's Thursday. You know what that means. She's a dear friend, a diaspora blend, a gym fanatic, a cuckoo could be erratic, but lovable, smart, funny. On a journey to discover what we actually discovered. Here we go, Batchaha. It's all Persian to us with Kian Nadimi. <laughs> What have you got for us, Keon? Well, we're now in March, and spring is just around the corner. The sun is shining, birds are chirping, flowers are blooming, and some of us humans are finally coming out of hibernation. Well, with warmer seasons coming up, one way many people spend their spring and summer days is gardening. Mm. Mm. I'm not one of those people, by the way. I prefer to drink margaritas and, you know, not do any intensive labor. Mm -hmm. But I digress. So one of the key items used in gardening, or farming for that matter, is... Uh, In the dirt. A hoe, a pitchfork, (laughs) a a, a spade. Uh, Fertilizer. Fertilizer. Uh, Yes. One of the very important ingredients used to make fertilizer is... Sulfuric acid. acid. Sulfuric acid. Yes, sulf- I pronounced that right. Uh, I looked okay, into it. <laughs> okay, sulfuric. Sulfuric we, acid. We invented sulfuric acid? We did, wow. yes. It was a Persian that first discovered this magical ingredient. By the way, I, I, are you running out of... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it used to be like wine and refrigerators. You, now it's you like make we fun. invented fertilizer. You make fun, but this, in fact, is one of the most important oh, okay. discoveries I'm ever open. made. I'm listening. Guess I'm who discovered Standing it. at attention. Well, can you guys guess who discovered it? Discovered this? Mm. A Persian person. Yes, but oh. uh, oh, I've, I've person? discussed him before. Um, Maybe Shia knows. Dariush. Gugush. <laughs> okay, well, let me just <laughs> sorry, make it sorry. easy. <laughs> sorry. Shia, do you know? No. Razi. Oh, oh, I know. What'd you say? Razi. Razi, yeah. Yes, yeah, because, that's good right. job. Yes. Really? He invented alcohol. Yes, the so genius that. physician, alchemist, ah. philosopher by the name of Zakaria Razi. Mm. Yes, and if you've been paying attention, I've uh, I discussed this back in uh, what was it, episode seventy two, seventy two, seventy two, seventy two, seventy two of. <laughs> yes, I discussed this on that segment of It's All Persian to Us, where I uh, brought up the fact that Razi actually made the made the discovery of alcohol yes. as a chemical compound. Yes. Well, around that time... He was a busy guy, this He was a busy man. Alcohol, (laughs) sulfuric acid. He pretty much saved the world with (laughs) this discovery, yeah. (laughs) So between 885 and 925 AD, around the same time that he discovered alcohol, Mm. he also discovered sulfuric acid. Okay. So you might be wondering, what is this sulfuric acid? What would, what, what, what is it used for? <laughs> I, wasn't, I wasn't really wondering that, <laughs> yeah. but uh, <laughs> please. Well, yeah. besides being used in the production of fertilizer, it's also used to make laundry detergent, oh. dyes, drugs, hello, explosives, mineral processing, wastewater processing, and oil refining. Okay. Yes. But in the age of health conscious millennials and with a generally growing appetite for healthy eating, the market for sulfuric acid is rapidly increasing year over year. Mm. This is due to an increase in manufacturing of nutrient rich food crops and in turn, a high demand for sulfur based fertilizers. Uh, And with the world's population constantly growing every year, this jewel of a compound is considered incredibly valuable when it comes to farming. An estimated 278 million tons is projected to be used worldwide in 2021. And to put things into dollar signs, because I know Mm -hmm. you guys always think about money, the global market for sulfuric acid is expected to reach 16.52 billion US dollars by 2025. Mm -hmm. So in a world dominated by humans, basic needs such as food are crucial. And with a growing population, we risk having food shortages in the future. So any new discoveries that help increase the food supply is priceless. Voran. So in today's world, we owe a lot to wise and noble Zakaria Razi. His discovery helped revolutionize farming and agriculture in the modern world. And while it's a billion dollar industry, the poor man didn't live to see a penny of it. After years of experimental work, Razi, also known as the greatest physician of medieval times, selflessly discovered sulfuric acid to build a better tomorrow. And since he also made uh, the discovery of alcohol, let's all raise our glasses to this great man. Mm. Bename Razi, mm. in the name of Razi. Oh, yeah. It's all Persian to us. Okay. Yeah. Yes, sulfuric acid. Bename Razi. Look into it. 
I'm really curious to know what did they call it back, back in you know for example because sul sulfur is hard for Persian speaker right. is hard to pronounce it sulfur, right? sulfur right uh, there's another word for it vetinol I think that's what it was something like that but I don't think that's what either. Persians call it. yeah vit vitriol is what yeah. uh, the street name of sulfuric acid is sulfuric acid yeah right. but uh, well, I don't know we, maybe yeah everybody asked right. their parents what's the Persian right. version of uh, actually we've got Chef Haas coming up so he, oh, uh, he, yeah. the, yeah. if I'm anyone sure would know so we'll see what what, okay. he, what he thinks but uh well that's very interesting mr mm -hmm. razi i i'm only sad that he's not collecting uh, a commission of yeah, all the, uh, the, the work that he he created back in the day like all the greatest painters and scientists of the past they don't they didn't make a penny of their work now very interesting yeah. thank you keon it's all persian to us we add to the list of things that were discovered by our ancestors, sulfuric acid. Let's get him on the line. He's the captain of cuisine, the culinary colonel, the Tabrizi talisman, the Farsi food meister, the Turkish tradesman. It's your chef, Hassare, and this is Rook Hospitality. Hi, this is your chef, Hassare, and this is Rook Hospitality. Hello, Chef Hoss. Hello, Jan John. Hello, team. How are you? I, were you were you on the line yet when we were doing the It's All Persian to Us? I enjoyed it very much. Okay. Do you know anything about sulfuric acid? Yes, a little bit. <laughs> do you know the Persian name for it? Not on top of my head oh, that's right okay. now. <laughs> now we, it, tried now it. we say acid sulfuric. But, acid sulfuric. But, True. but back oh, the in ancient time. Word, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think it used to be called Zedesh. <laughs> <laughs> Everything was called Zedesh. Uh, dear Chef, how is beautiful San Francisco? It's beautiful. I'm enjoying the weather. I'm at work actually. And okay. I'm excited. I am doing something very delicious a spring lamb for the no rules mm -hmm. at Google. So I'm excited. Oh, lucky, lucky Google employees that, that <laughs> get to savor your savory ideas. Uh, I see uh, for the segment today that uh, you're going to teach us about it's called How to Best Use Sumac in Persian cuisine, somal, sumac. So let's start off with the basics. What is sumac? Okay, sumac in the simple word is a spice and it's very popular in Iran and Middle East. And it's a berries, they grow wild in the like shrubs around the um, world and they pottered and um, it's relative to the poisonous shrubs by the same name, but the culinary variety is a safe to use and easily can be identified because they're red, vibrant color versus white ones. The white ones are the one poisonous, so you have to be careful. Okay, and and where does sumac grow? Sumac is basically the East uh, Asia, Africa, and North America, and pretty much Iran. But these three regions more dominated. And the beauty of this, they grow wild and is access uh, accessible to uh, a lot of people around the world. So, so what is the um, the culinary use of sumac in Iranian cuisine. Yeah, yeah great one. So, what, let me tell you what's the uh, profile of sumac. Sumac is like a base, it's like a fresh lemon juice, not tart, sweet, but not sour taste, and has a powerful punch. So, when you put this all together, and also is a versatile seasoning for the color and tartness in the cuisine. Then also compared to turmeric, which is, has an amazing health benefits. This one is, uh, you don't have to cook it. You can mix it with, the, you can just ground it, use these beautiful berries and ground them. And you can just uh, freshly you, sprinkle you on some of the dishes like a rice, kebab and other stuff and tomatoes, salad. You can make it dressing or you can use them as a rub, a rubbing agent, like a marinade and for the meat, fish, chicken. Mm -hmm. And um, this uh, sumac, it cuts through the this fatness of the lamb, duck, any other kind of meat and breaks on the fat and gives it this amazing punchy flavor. 
So your video this week uh, that people will be able to see on our Telegram channel and on our website, rookmedia.com, how to best use sumac in Persian cuisine. So so what are the, you've just mentioned a couple of them, kebab, I mean, we know, and, and rice. What are the best uses of sumac as you see it? Um, I see it on a daily basis for everything. I mean, uh, for me, is I one word as a chef, as a cook, I say, is a superstar ingredient should be on every spice cabinet. You're like it's, you can sprinkle on yogurt, aioli, oh. uh, avocado. It's like it has better flavor than lemon. Wow. So it's basically I put it this way to make it easier to understand. It's exactly similar to salt. Brings out the natural flavors of the food. It's cooked or raw. So you cannot go like you, the way you use salt on everything. I will tell you use sumac on everything. Wow, and it's probably not as bad for you as as salt, right? No, has uh, that's a second subject. I'm sure we're gonna talk about it about the health benefits out of it. It's yeah, amazing. yeah. You, the sumac has medical use. You've said how so? Well, actually, before culinary use, two thousand years ago, it was all used medical, uh, and um, this has uh, antioxidants in it, and it has a like a prevent from the cancer, uh, the heart diseases, diabetics. I can name it. It's a lot of lower the cholesterols. Uh, reverse the blood sugar con- and control the blood sugar and because of there's a tannin in it it's the name t-a-n-n-i-n tannin and that r- helps the glucose not to, to destroy the good proteins in the body so 81 percent helps that this blood sugar reverse it so and also prevent from the internal bleeding that's huge and they use that one so it uh, helps the muscle pains I can name it and it help with the bone. So uh, uh, bones. is there anything bad about using a lot of sumac? I mean, is it? Uh, no, there's no. It's actually <laughs> it helps you to age, uh, anti-aging. But the one thing you have to be careful, number one, don't use the white one poisonous. Second, the sprayers, when they're growing in the culinary one, you ha- you cannot use them fresh. You have to dry them first, 100%, then ground them. If you, did, if you use the uh, fresh one, you can get poisoned. Or you just you know, buy the, the, the powder form, the ground Yeah, you form, can yeah. buy the powders or you can buy the berries. I, I, I show on the video, I, I have the berries, whole berries, dry, and also have a powder. And most common is powder in the stores. You know what I love about you, Chef Haas? You're a great um, chef, but, you, but you're not doctrinaire about uh, how things have to be. I mean, this is a common theme with you where you say, Hey, whatever you like the taste of, try it, do it, expand uh, the from the traditions of uh, of Persian cuisine or any uh, particular national or international cu- cuisine, and and this uh, is kind of blowing my mind. I'm thinking right now about like you could take you could take French fries, you could take your French fries, and instead of pouring lots of salt on them, use sumac on your French fries. I mean, is that crazy or is that the kind uh, of thing? No, no, is that crazy? Actually, you're talking about, I used to make the aioli with sumac, heavy aioli for my French fries at my uh, previous restaurant. Mm-hmm. So you nailed it. I mean, you didn't know that, but your your mind's working like a fully meat. So that's the beauty of the cooking. So you can get creative. And right now, without you knowing that I already used it, but you already mentioned, that's beautiful. That is so really that's amazing. that's why I always teach people there is the one word in part of the the shayat. We don't have that buyer the shayat or has to be that. Be creative. It's you're going to eat it, play with it. Like I say, sumac, the beautiful about sumac versus turmeric, sumac can be applied to anything as it is. But turmeric is too, soup, too, too bitter, especially the powder. A fresh turmeric, I eat it raw. It's good for me, for you if you get used to it. But, this, but sumac versus turmeric, like I say, you can use on everything without but, doing But turmeric you use, uh, I use in stews and stuff. You don't necessarily put sumac in when you're making a stew, do you? No, that's why I'm saying that. Turmeric is good for cooking. You cannot use as a raw powder uh-huh, on your uh-huh, dishes. Yeah, right, but right. sumac can be I easily see, just, right, right. like you in the video, I am just sprinkling on everything. I am not talking <laughs> that much. And did so. I miss a step? It has anti-aging qualities, Chef Oz? Yes, ma'am. I'm gonna sp- I'm gonna start chugging somal now. <laughs> put it in my water, protein shake, <laughs> somal really? everything. You're gonna have a competition with Captain Reza. <laughs> <laughs> I was just thinking about the same thing when you say you can use it just like salt. It 
totally like interested me. I never knew. I always thought that it was something that probably wasn't good for us. It likes you know yeah. that's why you don't want to use too much of it uh, on your cello kebab or whatever <laughs> because you know. Uh, but so to so to hear that it's actually not that's not only is it, is it not bad for us, it's actually po- good for you. Yeah, is a lot if of that's benefits. If in, that's in true, salt though. You, but sorry, well, in, in yogurt it's though. It's actually exactly like salt. The, mm. Okay, what's the purpose of salt? We put salt, so like I mentioned, brings out the natural flavors of the food mm. and enhance it. So exactly the same thing sumac does it. And I give you example. I we do like pickle onions. There's pickle onions, quick pickle onion with the acid, like a vinegar. You don't need this one. Red on. I will recommend you guys next time you have a salad or sandwich, just slice some onion, red onion, sprinkle it with the sumac, and just then mm-hmm. apply to your sandwich or salad, uh, or the, uh, in Iran we do a lot of kebab, jigar. You'll be surprised to see how this onion gets beautiful flavor from sumac and enhance your kebab but sandwich. But then, da- then your dahan smells like uh, piaz. <laughs> Well, uh, make sure you don't kiss people. <laughs> I'll, I'll come to the studio and eat my piaz with some off. <laughs> uh, I'm going to make you something funny to guys laugh because when uh, Kian John was talking about <laughs> uh, fertilizer, okay, please don't laugh or laugh. I want to make you guys laugh. Can you believe that Iran imported some kind of tons of the fertilized human fertilizer from Turkey to Iran? Wait, wait, <laughs> like wait, human wait, wait. feces, human feces. <laughs> human, yep, yeah, human wait, fertilizer currently? for the uh, agriculture. Hey, Reza, you so, want to make a few extra bucks? <laughs> <laughs> well, we. <laughs> We've really crazy. <laughs> <laughs> things were things were going so well <laughs> with the happened. sumac talk, uh, Chef Haas. You are uh, you're you're a gem. I thank you, my brother. This is uh, by the way, Chef Haas. Before I let you go, like, are you? Uh, m- you know, I don't know how to turn off these friggin' notifications on my phone <laughs> of who's on Clubhouse. I twenty four seven. My phone is telling me Chef Haas is on Clubhouse again. Dude, are you? Do you do anything? What happened? You were running. You had a, 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 a diverse, balanced life. All of a sudden, you're on Clubhouse like every minute of the day. Okay, I tell you the truth. That, you know, I've been on my back on the floor in past few weeks, my back pain. So I am just bored, getting bored. Oh, so I'm okay. on it. But also, there's so much, so much excitement. Everybody wants to talk about the business restaurant. So and I went a few rooms to talk with them. But now I have... My own uh, room on Sundays at 10 o'clock, I brought Hamid Salimian, Hanif, oh, six, buddy. seven, yeah. the best chefs around the world. We're going to team up. Oh, we call great. it Iranian cuisine on the wow. bottom. We're going to take a past, present, future. We're going to have a guest book, book writer and people like yourself to be there, talk about food every Sunday at 10 o'clock. Also, I have six o'clock with the San Francisco icon uh, reporter and a, a, amazing superstar chef, Indian. We're going to talk about the kitchen disasters, kitchen fun, That's everything great, behind man. the That's scenes great. people they want to know. That's great. Although I got to correct you because uh, I know you're doing those great things, but also like every, you know, there's like uh, where to buy shoes. And it'll say Chef Haas is in that room. <laughs> like every single thing I've seen. <laughs> I, mean, I want to learn. I want to learn. <laughs> Aww, you're enjoying your clubhouse. By the way, tomorrow night, we just decided spontaneously, but tomorrow night, Friday night, are you around, Chef Haas? You should join I our... Be there. No matter what, I put everything inside, I will be there. Ah, you're the that. man. We're going to see you on clubhouse then. We'll see and you at just clubhouse. just give you a little hint. When you go clubhouse, make sure pin people that you know, they know that you come in and they come. So when you go to a start the room, on the bottom, there's a plus sign. Hit that plus sign, your friends, everybody in your chat right. room, they come and one by one pin them. I have no idea what I, I'm, I'm gonna get <laughs> Sav, Savvy I'll Rohan to figure this out. <laughs> I will come over there and help. Just put me uh, and we'll I put you in there. Rohan. We'll put you in there. Chef yeah. Haas, thank you. Have a great guy. I'm sorry to hear about your back. We'll, we'll hope that you'll uh, feel better. Um, you know what? Uh, you know what's good for um, a sore back is sumac. If you put some somal on the, just rub it on the lower back, it fixes everything. <laughs> <laughs> I will definitely do that. Love you, brother. We'll talk to you. Thank you so much. Hold you guys have a wonderful week. See you tomorrow night. Bye, Bye, Chef. Bye, bye. bye. Chef Haas Zare in San Francisco with hospitality. See the video of his, his latest video at rookmedia.com and on our Telegram channel, Rook Media, how to best use sumac or sumac in Persian cuisine. Well, that was great. Thank you, guys. So that, this is full time for Rook for today. Our website, rookmedia.com. 
where you can also see our first video footage of the interviews we do on the show with uh, Armin Amidi, as well as everything else on uh, that you hear on Rook is available on the uh, rookmedia.com website. Thanks to the amazing team who put this show together each week. Producer Susan, Thoughtful Nagin, the fabulous Keon, Ponta, the artist, Savvy Roham, Aray Merdad, Chef Haas, Master Muhammad, Captain Reza and Groovy Shia. Thank you to all of you out there supporting us, becoming patrons, sharing our content. Please subscribe if you haven't done so already on whatever platform you're on. That's free. <laughs> subscribe. You can find me on Instagram at Gian Gomeshi and somewhere on Club Clubhouse trying not to be lost. Mizun Bashi. Mm-hmm.